What's up guys, Coach Steve here and welcome back to the Rise Method Podcast. Today's episode I'm joined with Coach Nick. Nick, how are we doing? Really well, thank you. How are you? I like your intro. That's really... Nick, I had to bring the intro back. It had to be done. It had to be done. Uh, did anybody ask you to or did you just decide that? Well, look, I just feel like we need something just to, to like, a, like a launch pad, like a little, little springboard to get you going, get you started. And it's kind of like how you're getting ready to train right? Like if I said, Nick, right now in this call, go train, you might be like, oh, well, like, hold on a second. I might need to put my shoes on and maybe need to get dressed or, uh, you know, have a, have a drink first or have a meal and have my little ritual that we all go through when we go and complete that task. And sometimes when you say go, um, it can be challenging to go. And sometimes you need like a little bit of that springboard to get you started. Um, So that's what our little intro is, is that little springboard and we jump into it and here we are, Nick. Here we are. All right, cool. I'm ready. <laughs> All right, so we're ready to train. Let's do this thing. So, Nick, tell me, starting yeah, off, train. how has your training been? My training is awesome. Thank you. Uh, I'm living my best training life. I think we could just probably um, record that once and then just play it <laughs> in every podcast. But, yeah, no, uh, training is awesome. Thank you very much. Well, and tell me. Well, before I tell you about mine, uh, tell me, uh, this week compared to last week, uh, are we seeing improvements or same, same, um, you know, what, what, what's, what's new in training life? Little, little incremental improvements. Um, body fat is coming down as well. So that's, that's also a gauge of improvement at the moment, simply because that's a goal in terms of where I want to head. Um, so that's good. Um, strength is still there, which is awesome. So yeah, everything is feeling just really good. So I would say better than last week, you know, um, last week was great too, but like, you just, you know, there's great. And then there's greater and Mm -hmm. I'm greater than last week today. Great and greater. I like that. Mm -hmm. Well, when we ask you next week, you gotta be great tests next week. Yeah. And then after that, we'll start a whole new situation where it'll be um, amazing. Don't worry, we'll get a thesaurus then. It'll be fine, we set. Yeah, actually, in my little library. Oh, no, uh, this is not a visual. It might be. You might use this. See, there's a thesaurus there somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah, we'll get that out. We'll find new descriptive words. Yeah, let's do it. We'll do it. Uh, How's Nick, yours? Nick, my training is, uh, it's, 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 it's going good. I'm, I'm happy with it. Um, the past couple of weeks have been challenging, um, mainly due to sleep um, and a, and a mm-hmm. few sicknesses through the house. Um, but little baby Henry is starting to sleep through the night randomly. You know, last night he didn't, uh, but the night prior he did. So sleep's getting back, which has correlated nicely into the pumps that I'm experiencing in the gym. Um, so that's been a big focus of me lately is uh, getting into some work in the garage, my little garage gym, a um, little sidestep away from powerlifting work right now into a little bit of like a uh, hypertrophy build work, um, getting a good, good, good pump in and that reconnection with um, DOMS, which has been really exciting. So yeah, just really focusing on slowing the movement down, continue to kind of tweak little things like tweak my feet positioning, tweak, tweak where my kind of hips are placed, where the center of gravity is, that, that type of stuff. Little tweaking always goes far. Um, and the outcome has been really great. You know, today really feeling it, especially in my quads, um, just from doing some really controlled and slow squats, um, a much lighter load than I've done in the past. Um, but the connection you get with it is, is just really powerful. Um, and yeah, definitely, definitely feel it today. So I'm pretty happy with it. So, um, yeah, I think that really highlights, you know, that you don't need to train one particular way forever. You're allowed to just modify things. Yeah. Absolutely. And can I just say something about George, your son? Yep. What do you think I'm going to say? What did what did he do that I would have seen that I'd be excited about? Uh look, he does lots of things. Um he was on a bike the other day. He Did was... he see a bunny? He was at a farm where he saw a bunny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, and he definitely loved the bunny. Little guinea pigs are running around too. So there's one particular fluffy one that he really liked, and that's the one we snapped the photo of. That's the angora. That the angora. angora rabbit is very, very important. And that angora rabbit needs as much looking after as people need to look after themselves within the, the challenge. 
<laughs> oh yes, that bunny. Gosh, um, yeah, it it's was my favorite. Yeah. Um, but I was out in Melbourne, went to uh, Mayuna Farm, if you've ever been there before, before Nick's been around for a while, a good few, few decades yeah. around here yeah, and uh, little baby George loved that one. He loves the rabbits because yeah. so does Laura. So yeah. she would like a bunny. Yeah. Uh, so Nick, we are on week five of the first ever Rise Method Challenge. So we're just at that halfway mark. Um, and I want to touch on a few points made in the weekly check-in this week. Uh, so mm -hmm. firstly, uh, quite a number of people are finding some challenges with adapting to change. And I think we all find those challenges when change gets thrown at us and usually things that aren't completely in our control. So these individuals highlighting things like school holidays coming in, you change the system, the kids are at home or you're going uh, away on, on break and camping or whatever you're doing, that can provide change. Um, also changes in your family environment, maybe your, your partner's away or your partner's sick or your kids are sick, family responsibilities change, you'll look after your mum, your dad, whatever it is, that can be a change in our life. Uh, and another big one is work related changes. So, you know, maybe deadlines are coming up, maybe we're changing jobs, changing careers, uh, maybe changing positions within the company that we're working in. And all these changes are things that we kind of need to adapt to. And here's the deal, you know, we enter the fitness journey with a plan, like a map, um, but then things get thrown at us and we need to make modifications. It's literally like when we go, let's say we go hiking uh, or orienteering. Nick, do you like orienteering? Have you done that before? You know, get the compass out, go, go hiking? Uh, I do. I do like orienteering. I mean, I like hiking, mm -hmm. but I, I probably would be likely to not follow the, the map. Yeah, right. So, um, you know, I think we, we are following the map because we might not know the ter terrain completely um, or not have the complete skills to just kind of off we go and walk and be Bear grills and look at the, the sun and that make let that direct us. So we've got our map, but then things might change, like the weather might roll in and we might need to make that decision and go, okay, we need to camp here rather than continue going. Um, and those changes can be stressful and hard to make. Um, but what we need to do is to firstly look at our environment and say, okay, this changes that it, it, that's happening to us. Is it affecting our environment? Can we continue on our plan uh, and make minor tweaks or do we need to pull the plan completely to the side? So that's firstly, we're looking at our environment. Next, it's worth considering what resources we have available to us. So if we're going on like a holiday, family holiday, school holidays, going camping, all right, what resources are available to us? Hey, you're going glamping and there's a kitchen there. Awesome, great. So now we're cooking meals or maybe there's a fridge you have access to. All right, now we're meal prepping in some variety. Oh, there's a gym at this campsite. How awesome is that? We can now train at this campsite or maybe you are switching your training in a gym to going for longer walks or maybe going swimming because there's the beach there or something. So we're looking at what resources we have available to us. And then finally, you know, we are just readdressing our plan going, okay, for this short period of time, is it worth me focusing on this plan or should I put it to the side? You know, if I'm going on literal holiday, like some members in our community have recently been on cruises. So if I'm going on a cruise and I'm going on that cruise for five nights, um, it's this massive holiday I've been planning forever. I can either try to stick to my diet and my training program and maybe not completely enjoy the cruise experience, or I just put my, my strategy to the side for a moment, enjoy that, that time on holiday on break. And then when I come back, I reconnect with my program and go um, and be consistent on that. So a few strategies to manage change. Nick, do you have anything you would say about someone who might come to you and say, oh, like, you know, I've got this thing coming up. I might need to change X, Y, Z. What could I do? Okay. Depending on the urgency of the goal, uh, I would adjust my response depending on um, yeah what they tell me about what what their goal is and how rigid you need to be for that. So the first thing that springs to mind is for people that are doing the challenge that are just wanting to get better, healthier, there's also the side, the social side of it. You know, if you've paid to go on a cruise, spend time with your family, this is a big deal. They've often got like all sorts of buffets, I'm sure, on cruises and things. It's memories over macros. I like that saying. I think that that's really important to bring that in when your goal is long-term. You can afford 
to take a couple of days or you know a week um, for your cruise and enjoy that side of it. You, there'll be benefits where you might come back refreshed with a new attitude. Um, you'll spend time with your family. So there's so many reasons why you just need to enjoy. Um, and yeah, the other side of it is if look, if you've got a rigid goal, say like my goal at the moment, then you probably already know what to do and you don't even need my advice. But for the people that are just establishing themselves in fitness, trying to reconnect with stuff, trying to find where they fit in, it's really important that you actually take the time to have that memories over macros. That would be my, my first thing to say. I apart like from that. going through all the healthy options that you can possibly tweak and do all that but if you're on a, an awesome cruise and you're stopping at places and just say that you you know somebody serves you off a meal that's from that particular culture that you you might um you know spend some time somewhere as if you're going to say well actually thank you very much i can't eat that you know you actually want to enjoy the experience that's what you're paying for yeah yeah no totally agree i like that memories over macros are uh... You know, sometimes you're right. We really sacrifice the you know experiences in our life, the joy in our life, um, for the kind of long term fitness goal. And I think long term, like you want to still enjoy life, right? Like we want to, and we're just mainly talking about food. And uh, I think that also goes across with training as well. Like if you are on holiday and you've got a jam packed schedule, but then you go, oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to go to the Coliseum because I got to go train really quickly. It's like, well, you're in Rome. Like when you're in Rome, come on, go see the Coliseum. Like you can train another day. And I remember this saying once it was, you know, life of course is long, but it's also short. Um, meaning that, yeah, you want everything right now, but we've also got time. We can do everything later. Like we don't need to do everything today. And in the short period of time, that answer is completely different. We've got a, we've got a bigger goal like yourself, Nick. Hey, competition is coming up in how many weeks? Week? Nick is it 13? Like 11. 11. Countdown's on. So, you know, 11 weeks. All right. Okay. You got your okay game plan. You got to stick, stick to your plan. But if you're maybe not have a big deadline coming up and you're like, Hey, I just want to be fit for life. All right, man, you can just chill out. Like your kids are sick. Just make sure you're there to your priority or all right, you've got a, this deadline coming up at work. Let's focus on that right now. And there's always time later to go and train and go and eat well. Um, but I'm sure that many of us are still making good nutritional choices are still being physically active. Like just because we're adapting to change doesn't mean that you've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Like we're still eating, you know, good food. We're still keeping ourselves hydrated and looking after ourselves and being healthy, right? Yeah. And also the other thing is like what I would probably do as well is just, you know, stay active on the cruise, like go for, for a few walks around the ship and see what's going on. They're quite big. Um, you know, that sort of thing, because that'll actually just also clear your head and make you feel good or go, you know, have a little swim in the pool there, do that as well. And um, then you've covered all bases. You don't have to go and into the, the, the gym there, but just, you know, do a little bit of activity and then enjoy. Yeah. Now, Nick, related to dealing with change, there are some members this week that are facing the challenge of stress stress maybe from those mm -hmm. changes um, and then the subsequent emotional eating that sometimes is accompanying stressful situations. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we all have our kryptonite foods where when we're stressed, when we're tired, when we're fatigued, we start reaching for those foods. And some common ones are things like chocolate and chips and candies. For me, it's hummus, it's yogurt, it's maybe carby foods like sandwiches, breads, pastas, rices. So we all have those certain foods that we, we know that, you know, deep down, we know what are our, our stress eating foods. And it's a tricky one to manage. Like, what are we going to do when we're stressed? Then we start reaching for those foods to help manage our emotions. And this is probably well above our pay grades and what we work with as fitness professionals. However, I'm sure we can offer some tips on what we can do if we are kind of reaching for that chocolate bar when we are stressed out. So Nick, my first tip is to think about adding a pause. So before we make the decision to go and eat a certain food, and if we know that that food isn't great for us, and we know it's our stress eating food like chocolate, uh, is to add a pause and go, okay, like, do I really want this right now? Um, and I hope that you've listened to previous episodes of the Rise Method podcast, where we talk about things like making those foods harder to reach. So if you have a bowl of chocolate, in on your kitchen table and you walk past it every day of course you're going to want to have 
that bit of chocolate when you're stressed out. But if that chocolate is maybe in the cupboard or in the other room or a little bit harder to get to, okay, you've added a bit of friction there. But before you go and complete that task, add that pause, like take that moment and think, okay, do, is this something I really want right now? Am I actually hungry or am I stressed out? So think about that moment, add that pause. And that could be literally stop and pause. It could be to maybe just go outside for a moment, come back before we make that decision. At the pause, you might see a different response than wanting to stress eat. Yeah, definitely. And also sometimes you, if you, if you're the type of person that, that doesn't eat, cause you know, you, you don't eat during the day or something like that, you find yourself so hungry by the end of the day that you, you don't even know if it's stress or it's just your, your, your response, your body's response to just wanting to get some calories in and and it's not going to go for a lean piece of chicken. It's going to go for the most calorie dense thing that you can find just to make you feel like you can do the rest of your day. So mm-hmm. just remember that as well. So it's about always about just keeping in mind how to best look after yourself, even when you are stressed, um, try and plan it a little bit more because um, otherwise your ability to think clearly is gone when you're mm-hmm. stressed. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know if there's anyone out there who doesn't eat when they're stressed. That's me. I don't eat because I can't. My so I'm, I suppose I'm lucky because I I my I shut down. But I don't know if that's good. But I just have the opposite problem. So then I have to think of ways to fuel myself. So I'll be if I've got a really bad thing going on, I'll have to have like a a soup or something, mm-hmm. like an invalid. <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah, I was going to say the other strategy to overcome like stress eating like if you are one to eat when you're stressed or anxious or worried or you've got things on your mind you eat is to really think about that idea of mindful eating when you are consuming that food really think about enjoying that food and i've asked this question to people who've come to me and said oh you know i ate a whole tub of ice cream and you know we can go into why you might have sat there and ate the whole tub of ice cream yeah okay it's because you're sitting on the couch eating, watching netflix or because you're really stressed whatever it was but the question always should be you know did you enjoy it were you paying attention while you were eating that food and unfortunately half the time most folks don't even remember eating at all and we've probably all had that experience where we might open up a bag of um i don't know chips or a, ba- uh, a block of chocolate or whatever it is that we open up and before you know it, you just inhale it all and you're like, oh, geez, I don't even remember having the entire bag. And that is kind of like that disconnect from the food that we're eating uh, to our emotional state. So if you are reaching for a certain food, whatever it is, take a moment and think, you know, am I enjoying this? And it's okay to enjoy it. Hey, you eat the whole tub of ice cream. Hey, did you feel good eating it? Yeah. Okay, great. Congratulations. You ate a whole tub of ice cream. You felt good eating it, now we've got to face those consequences. But what might not be helpful is if you ate the whole tub of ice cream and you didn't even know that you ate the whole tub, maybe because you were distracted, maybe because you were thinking about, oh, geez, I've got this deadline tomorrow and you're just munching away, or you're just really stressed and anxious because, uh, you know, mortgage rates are rising, inflation, um, cost of living, and you're just sitting there munching away on all the food. Before you know it, you've, you know, eaten the whole cake. So I think, stress and emotional eating is something that we all kind of go through and some of us emotionally eat and consume food and others like you experienced nick um emotionally eat by by not eating and not going through those processes and that's just as bad Mm -hmm. that's just as bad like not that it's bad but it's it's actually it's just as destructive to do that as it is to excessively overeat Mm -hmm. yeah Mm. No, I totally agree. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I think the follow-on effects is you might go, oh, well, yeah, I just was so stressed or, or busy or whatever. I just didn't even, even eat lunch. But then what happens is maybe dinner, you overconsume because you're so hungry. And then maybe you start snacking through the evening and you're craving foods in the middle of the night just because you just want to get more calories in. And then you make those choices where you want to have the whole block of chocolate, not realizing you just had 800 calories worth of chocolate rather than an actual meal. Uh, and then it faces other problems. So yeah, like stress really affect us when we're trying to do this fitness thing. Mm. Mm. Now, Nick, uh, the other week I was taking my uh, Cert 4 students through a nutrition class. And one of my students asked me, um, what's the difference between slow and fast metabolisms? 
And he then went on to say that he's always had a fast metabolism and really struggled to put on weight. Um, and what's the difference between someone with a slow metabolism and a fast metabolism? And I found this question really fascinating because it's a, it's a common question and common language we see around people who um, are struggling with their body weight and might say, oh, I've just got a slow metabolism or someone who's always really lean struggling to put on weight. Oh, it's just got a fast metabolism. And it's this language that it's almost not our fault. It's like a, this, it's this concept of locus of control. It's an external locus of control. Oh, it's just, it's just a fast metabolism. That's why I can't put on weight or, oh, I've got a slow meta metabolism. And that's why I struggle to uh, lose weight. It's just, you know, something that's not in my control. It's just my metabolism. Uh, and I want to speak, speak a little bit about this because I think there are some things that we can control about our metabolism. Um, and there's some things that are more genetic based. Okay. So I think we need to start. What is the metabolism? Metabolism, of course, is how our body uses energy. So it's how we consume energy and then expend that energy. And that's the umbrella of the metabolism. Okay. So what we're primarily referring to is, you know, how we absorb the, the calories that we consume, uh, the energy that we consume, and then how we then use that energy for functions. Okay. Now, some of us have bigger metabolisms because there are more of us. So, you know, like myself, I'm about a hundred kilos, a bit of muscle on me. So I use more energy just to move around, just to get out of bed, just to stay alive, just to, for my bones to, to be there, my muscles to be there, I require more energy. So my metabolism is greater. I think when we start looking at things like fast and slow metabolisms, there might not be the correct descriptive words. Uh, it's kind of like the size of the metabolism. So in contrast, maybe Nick, you're a little bit smaller than I am. So you might have a smaller metabolism than I do, um, requiring less energy just slightly, um, because there's probably a little bit less of you than there is of me. And that's, that's okay, because that's just the differences in humans. So when we look at it in isolation, you know, Coach Nick versus Coach Steve, our metabolisms will be different, um, just because we're different humans. And I think that is one fallacy of describing someone as fast and slow, is because you may have a greater metabolism than somebody else, because there is more of you, or you have uh, you're, you're taller or you're heavier than someone else. So you always, to describe someone as fast and slow, you are basing it off another individual. So it's not um, an objective measure. It is like subjective. You need someone else to base that, right? It's like saying, oh, you're taller, taller than who? There's probably someone taller than you and you're probably shorter than someone else. So it's, it's hard to describe someone like, like that first off. So that's mm. the metabolism in a nutshell. It's how we utilize energy, right? Mm. Now, when we think about someone who might have this quote fast metabolism, metabolism quote slow metabolism often it, it is describing other things so the first thing i would say is that some of us like you suggested nick just before our response to emotional states can change our behaviors so if i was someone to stress eat and you are someone to stress not eat. If we are both stressed, then I am consuming more calories. And then Nick, you're consuming fewer calories. If we just ignore what we were saying before about the follow on effect of that. So then what might happen is chronically over time, I am chronically consuming more calories because we're interacting with stress. You're chronically under consuming calories because you're interacting with stress. So then when we go and compare ourselves, oh, who's got the fast, who's got the slow metabolism, I would say I've got the slow metabolism because I'm consuming more calories. I'm struggling to lose weight. You might say I've got the fast metabolism because I'm struggling to gain weight because you're just not eating food when you're stressed. So that is one example of our emotional response dictating our behavior with food, which then dictates, oh, it must be fast and slow metabolism and it's not in my control. Oh, well, okay. It's our response and it's our maybe psychological response, but we still have some control over that or control of eating that food. So that's one example of the difference between fast no, no. and slow. The, the crack up bit about that though, is that ultimately you are in a better position than me, because if I've dropped my calories to barely nothing and I'm stress, not eating and stress walking, which is like what I can also tend to do, then um, I'm going to find it really hard to drop calories even more to lose weight if there's nothing happening with my weight. Whereas with you, because you're nice and fueled up, you just drop a little bit and you, you're gone. 
You know what I mean? So ultimately then you could say that that um you have the faster metabolism because suddenly when we're if we're doing a weight loss from based on that, you'll have the results and I'll be I'll be like, oh my God, what? And have 10 cups of coffee and stress about it and not eat. Yeah, like your I would agree. Um and also challenge a little bit. I'm I'm talking more chronic long term, right? Like mm -hmm. if we let if we had two people, um one was a stress eater and one was a stress not eater and we put them in two little houses next door to each other and we left them for 10 years. Um, and we applied a bit of stress onto those humans and we had no intervention. So no training plan, no nutrition plan to say, hey, do life. Um, I'm sure the folks who stress eat are more likely to be uh, uh, heavier and, and have that quote, slower metabolism struggle to lose weight versus someone who is the stress not eater and they would be um, you know, thinner, leaner, maybe struggling to put on weight um, just in the complete isolation. When we add an intervention like a training plan, a meal plan that can change things. And then like you said, Nick, if we then wanted to make changes to our goal, uh, you know, like changing our body composition, I might find it easier because there's more of me, whereas mm. you, you may be lean and uh, as it is, and if you wanted to lose more weight, you might really struggle with that because you are leaner. Mm. Now, that's one example. The next example quickly is that we all have a different response to fed states. So when we do consume a meal or we have um, particularly a large meal, we all have a certain response to it. Some of us want to you know, sit down and digest our food and some of us want to get up and party. And you may know people like this where you, know, you have a, a dinner and maybe a family event and there's always the same folks who want to just kind of sit down and maybe you know, have the cup of coffee or play some board games and just have a, like a relaxed fed state time. Whereas others, when they've eaten some food and have some energy in them, they want to go and party. They want to clean up everything and rearrange the furniture and go and dance and do other things, right? And that response to a fed state often correlates to those who have, quote, faster metabolisms or ones who want to party. And those who, quote, have slower metabolisms want to kind of relax and sit down. Again, um, in isolation, you know, we've all kind of had that experience. Yeah, sometimes I overeat and I want to go dance and the other times I overeat and I just want to sit down. Yeah, okay, it's not one or the other. It's on a bit of a spectrum. But those of us who are more inclined to want to just kind of relax when we are in a fed state tend to have, quote, these slower metabolisms. Whereas those of us who want to get up and party tend to have, quote, the faster metabolism. Yeah? Have a guess which one I am. You're the party animal, right? Well, yeah, like, do I ever stay still, really? Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a fidgeter. I'm, I, I fidget. Mm -hmm. I gesticulate. I, you know, I, I just cannot stay still. Yeah. Mm. Um, I'm a bit of a mix. So when I'm in a fed state, I like to just chill out. And then other times I need to get up and, and do things. Um, so a bit of a blend. Yeah. You're a blended. I'm You're blended. like one of your wines. I'm a, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, the next area is around our environment, of course, uh, that plays a major impact in it. And, you know, we mentioned some of those things already, like if you live in a household where there's always a bowl of chocolate sitting on the kitchen table um, and every time you walk past and you grab a little, you know, thing of favorites, little chocolate thing. Uh, chronically over time, you're going to consume more calories than others who always have maybe a fruit bowl available to us or maybe live in a house where there isn't a plethora of delicious food always available. Like if you're living in a share house by yourself versus living at your parents' house and your, you know, your parents are both chefs and you've always got food in your house, you might be inclined to eat more food versus not eat as much food. So your environment can shape you know, your experience with the metabolism, right? Now, the final point I'll make is actually um, fresh research that came out um, by Greg Knuckles, and he was talking a little bit about the differences in organ size and that effect on the metabolism. And what he concluded from his research was that common calorie prediction tools or energy expenditure tools, like the joy state Mifflin equation that we use in the RISE method, um, have a small error rate. And that's um, he de determined that it was about 60% of people were within 200 calories of that equation. And it was 98% of people were within 400 calories of that, that equation up or down. So if you complete the equation and you do, you get 2000 calories is the number on that equation, 
um, almost everybody is within 400 calories of that number. So between 1600 and 2400, um, 60% of us are within 200 calories. Um, so, you know, there is a little bit of variance in that number. And that could be two people of identical height and weights and potentially muscle size thrown in there as well. And what he concluded was the effects of different organ sizes. And that may be a genetic thing where some of us might have genetically larger, you know, livers or genetically larger um, bowels or whatever parts we have. So there is an element of genetic factors and a little bit element of that external locus of control, things that are outside of our control. But I do think that many of us can um, influence our metabolism if it's fast or slow. And that could take a little bit of effort where you might want to be one to sit down and relax after you're in a fed state um, or you know, stress eat, or you're in an environment that allows for overconsumption of calories. And it might take a bit of effort to change those things. But if we make that shift from that external locus of control to internal locus of control, we can see some really powerful changes in our body composition. Mm. Nick, I'd like mm. to wrap up with a couple of questions that came up on the forum this week. So Nick, the first question here, um, this individual writes, hello, everyone looking for advice on exercises that help move the fat that sits on your hips. I'm an hourglass shape and struggling to target these areas. I'm carrying weight over the love handles, if that makes sense. And she posted a photo um, pointing at kind of like where the love handles are, maybe those saddlebags that we, that we speak about kind of around the outside of the hips. So mm -hmm. Nick, what would you say to somebody who is looking to, spot reduce i want to target a certain area um, particularly around my hips yes now firstly i'll just say from from a biological viewpoint um that's actually uh, an ideal sort of uh situation for a woman like we're, we're supposed to have fat on our bums and hips and things that like that kind of a shape is actually um a great shape it's more when we start to get into that apple shape where we've got a lot of fat around our abdominal region that, that you start to sort of worry a bit about for health reasons, but for aesthetic reasons, I know what you're meaning. Um, unfortunately, look, if I had the, the cure for this, then I'd be rich, but you can't actually choose where the fat comes from. So it's just play the long game. So if you're wanting to get lean, you might actually find that, uh, your upper body as a woman often gets lean fairly quickly and then you have to dig a lot deeper to see those changes in the lower body and you might decide that it's not worth it uh that you know you have to just you know get super strong uh love your shape for the way it is i know that nobody wants to hear that but uh yeah you, you have to dig pretty deep to get rid of every last ounce of fat off yourself to be honest so um but the answer is just keep playing the long game and it will eventually come away because it has no choice but at what consequence so you want to your, your body's a bit like a bank account you're going to spend a little bit there you're going to withdraw a little bit there so you have to kind of keep an eye on what's going on and decide what your limit is yeah i i i, I agree the long game is the important part because there are biological and genetic factors involved, you know, mm. men will hold their body weight oh, normally around their midsection. So that's where you get that really stereotypical um, overweight middle-aged man with the, the, the kind of the dad body, you know, a bit of a beer belly going, mm. little legs, little arms type thing. And they're mostly holding their body fat around their midsection. Whereas mm. in contrast, uh, females tend to hold their body fat around their hips and thighs where like you experienced nick you're you lean out in your upper body quite quickly whereas mm -hmm. holding the weight around your hips and thighs take a little bit a little bit longer so um for this individual and any other women listening out there if you are experiencing body fat around your hips and thighs firstly it's perfectly normal you know that's something that it might be just completely biological where you want to hold body fat around your hips and thighs and that might be the last place to go now, uh, a little bit genetic where you might find a bit of a blend where like myself, I hold a bit of body fat around my hips and thighs. Um, and 
that's okay, right? So even though I'm a guy and I'm probably holding a bit more body fat around my midsection, I do hold a little bit of body fat around my hips and thighs and that could be totally normal. And you might be listening to this and you're a female and you say, oh, well, Steve, I've got really lean legs, but I hold all my body fat around my midsection. Okay, a bit of genetic factor in there as well. But on average, biologically, males and females will hold body fat in different areas of their body. Now, when we do go through a weight loss process and we start to lose weight, again, you know, we slowly lose weight a little bit of everywhere. We can't target a specific area. Maybe I have seen some literature that suggests that, okay, we if we were doing lots of exercise of a particular muscle group, let's say our legs, we might find a little bit more body fat loss in the legs compared to the rest of the body, but it's not significant enough that we actually see it. You know, we measure it with really accurate um, tools. We can't actually visibly see it. It doesn't make a noticeable difference. However, I think there are there are some things we can do, Nick, if we do want to focus on a particular area. And we spoke about this in the past, in previous episodes of the podcast, and we talk about spot enhancement rather than spot reduction. So you might find if you want to improve, um, let's let's talk about a different area. Maybe you, your arm. That's a common area as well. You know, like that. What's it called? The, the tuck shop arms is that what people mm-hmm. call them yeah you know you might be holding a bit of body fat around your arms and you might go well i want to lose body fat around my arms specifically okay cool um we probably need to follow the same diet and and strategy if you wanted to lose fat everywhere but we're following that but what you can do is focus on building muscle in that area so if you are looking at your arms, you're like, oh, geez, they're just so like loose and I'm not happy with them and I want to lose body fat in my arms. You may benefit from training your arms, building some muscle in your arms, and you'll see an improvement in the shape of your arms, even if the body fat doesn't change. So you enhance that spot rather than try to reduce that spot. So if you are sitting there looking at maybe your love handles or you know, your saddlebags or your hips and being like, oh, I just got this body fat on my hips, You may benefit from strengthening your hips, strengthening your glutes and strengthening the muscles around that area. So it changes your physique and makes everything look better, even if you don't change anything about your body fat at all. So think about that mindset shift instead of spot reduction, spot enhance, trying to enhance that area by building muscle and changing the shape and the tone of the resting muscles in that area. Yeah, I I do agree with that. I think any changes that I've made, my body fat stays relatively the same in general. Like I'm fairly lean as a, as an individual, but like when it, since I've grown my shoulders and glutes, I, I look like a completely different human, like a yep. different human. Mm. And we see that in physique sports, you know, like um, like women in uh, bikini divisions who are mainly judged off their, you know, their hips and thighs, right? Uh, they would be training their shoulders um, and their lats to create that hourglass shape. Because if you have bigger lats and uh, bigger shoulders, then everything tapers in. It looks more of a taper, so you get more of that hourglass figure and shape. So we're looking at the whole body to change the appearance of one particular area. And you may benefit in a mindset shift of going, okay, I'm going to try to lose body fat in this area by training my whole body. Um, and then it kind of shifts it into all of it and go, well, okay, I'm just training my whole body. I'm not focusing on one particular area or trying to focus on my flaws or where I think my flaws are. I'm now focusing on just building me. And once we kind of change that that mindset of, oh, I'm looking at the negative parts to saying, hey, I'm building everything up. Hey, that's just a massive win, I reckon. Yeah, your focus changes and... Um that's yeah that's next level so Mm -hmm. let's encourage everyone to go there for sure absolutely nick uh final question here um slightly long one but stick with it so the question is um exercises that focus on core strength question mark it sounds silly but i have a really strong stomach from belly button upwards but below my belly button i feel very weak since having kids I'm struggling to lock it in when lifting weights, especially lower body deadlifts, lunges, etc. I feel like it balloons out and I'm lifting with my upper back strength. Any advice or exercises or mind body connections I should focus on would be appreciated. So Nick, without jumping in onto the like semantic parts of you know, how is your belly strong from belly button up or you know lower body deadlifts as opposed to upper body deadlifts, we're not diving into those language points. If someone wanted to improve their core strength, um, what advice would you give to them? 
Okay, can I just say one thing? Um, I just I just want to double check that this person's referring to their lower belly and not something like within, say, their pelvic floor and things, because I don't know when they had kids or what's going on there. So, I mean, first thing to do is like just to to double check with like an allied healthcare professional that that there's nothing going on with the pelvic floor or things that might have been missed after having the kids, or if it's a C-section. You know, there's just different things that can feel a bit loose down there that that might not be. That sounds bad, but you know what I mean. It might not <laughs> might not be um all about necessarily the core. It might just be a bit confusing the feeling. So mm -hmm. um, it depends how long ago it was that that the children were born. But um, I just wanted to point that out. So um, yeah, if you're looking for specific exercises that you do to strengthen the core, I mean, look as we say, I mean. Your, your major lifts do actually work your core. Um, that's how you kind of stay upright and, and you know, that's how you can perform the movement. So, I mean, if I'm going to be really full on, I'll just say do it with a lighter weight but the same kind of movement and um, just really possibly get your technique assessed and make sure that you, you're not rounding the upper back. But see, rounding the upper back also comes from um, – maybe not active not not kind of um, being aware of say your lats and pulling them in towards your shoulder blades things like that when you when you're deadlifting so there might be just some cues and it might also be just that you need to regress the weights a little bit just to to learn those cues and um you know even pushing the floor away what rather than thinking about pulling it up but then um yeah if you, if you just want some really good movements that that um are good for your core i mean well anything that sort of ch challenges your stability type thing although we do talk about that functional training and say well what's that every single exercise in the gym really does that but um do you want me to give like an example of some some exercises that you could do well let's say someone came to you and said uh like i don't feel my quote lower abs or i don't feel the from my belly button down um, what, uh, maybe cues could you give that person, um, maybe to get them that, that sensation back in that area and, and assuming that it's not like a pregnancy related thing where it's oh. C-section okay. and you just can't feel cause it's the changes in, in that, um, what, what, well, what, what could they do? What I love is, um, the good old vacuum. I love that just to really connect with, um, the lower abs because yeah, that is an, unforgiving exercise so um you could you could look look up how to vacuum i don't know if do you do, do we have a video of vacuums at all no no, no video but, um, mm. but what is it how do you describe it well uh, what's the best way to describe it you 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 breathe okay you you push all the air out and then you you push against your i'm trying to do it right now push against your um push against your tummy with your hands and then pull your tummy back as far as you can um away from your hands the only way you can really do it is to um vacuum it back i don't know if that's the best way to describe it but you just concentrate on pulling that lower tummy away from your hands yeah or just i I always think of it as just 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 suck everything in as hard as you can. <laughs> yeah, um, true. And it's a it's so a pretend that you're buttoning up your tightest pair of jeans. Yeah, that's, and, that's a vacuum. and of course, like you know, we can just suck in or like there's that kind of like sucking in from under the like under the ribs. Um, a tricky one to to teach, and I think it got really popular in like kind of the golden age of bodybuilding, or you see like um, Arnold and the like holding the vacuum pose. Um, the best way I've taught it is if you are leaning over slightly. So if you have like maybe a bench or a table and you just kind of put your elbows down on the table and you just really try to suck in there um, or even just like hands on the knees and just try to like suck in, um, you might get that ex that feeling is what we're trying to experience. It's a good one. Yeah. Uh, so I like that one for, for that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, but then you see if you don't have that feeling that's going to be a really that's more of an advanced one to start off with um mm -hmm. so uh, i mean another one that that is quite good is um 
that cat cow stretch that's in that's in yoga and possibly even Pilates, it, it mm -hmm. might come into play because when you stick it right out like a cow and then you suck it back in like a cat, you really have to engage with what's going on down there to get those two movements. So that's another one that I would probably use to encourage someone to understand what bits of their body are working and, um, you know, work with that lower ab. Because I'm thinking lower abs, because if I said to you, like the, the standard thing would be people to go, oh, you know, do some crunches or do this and that. But the problem is you're only going to use the muscles that you already feel like you can use, which is why you know that your upper abs are stronger. You've probably been doing crunches and you're like, I can't feel the lower ones. So you're not engaging with that. But then also, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one to say without actually assessing the person mm -hmm. individually. That's all. But there are, there's a myriad of things that, that you can kind of do, but it really depends on what you're referring to. Another one that I like is um, I quite like your dead bug. That's quite a good one to mm -hmm. um, anything where, where you're lowering the legs and raising them up again, that, that requires quite a bit of um, lower, lower body, lower ab strength. So that's another one to sort of incorporate in, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like, I like that. Um, I think just like bringing it back a little bit, like I like we said about like pelvic floor, where when we look at the abdominals in isolation, mainly referring to things like the rectus abdominis, the six pack muscle, um, and then our other abdominals, like our obliques, internal, external, um, and then the um, transverse abdominis, they're really our abdominal muscles. They're very broad muscles and they're not really described as like, you know, upper and lower portions. They get like the same nerve innovation, meaning that when you contract your abs, the whole abs contract. It's like a bicep, you know, you don't have an upper and lower bicep. It's just the bicep. Um, so I think the problem is the, the feelings and sensation of it. And I assure you that if you are going through spinal flexion or lumbar flexion, meaning that you're bending the spine or your ribs are getting closer to your hips, your abs are like working because they need to, to get that, that movement. The problem when I see folks trying to train their quote abs is that they're using lots of like hip flexor, like their spine is almost in extension. They're laying on their back. Their spine is in extension. They're trying to do leg raises and all that's moving is their hip joint, which is great to strengthen the hip flexors, but the abdominals aren't like changing shape at all. Like the spine isn't going through flexion at all. Um, so what I would recommend if you want to feel the lower abs again is to really isolate the movement. And I think the easiest way to do that is maybe like lay on your back, bend your knees, like you're about to do a hip raise. When you're laying on your back, start by trying to quote, activate the pelvic floor. And the easiest way to describe that is the muscles that you use to stop peeing. So when you go to the toilet and you need to stop peeing, that's kind of the easiest way to describe the pelvic floor. So you're laying on your back, your knees are bent, really safe position, squeeze the pelvic floor like you're trying to stop the pee from coming out. Then think about where your lower back is and then try to press your lower back as hard as you can into the floor. And when you do that, you're trying to press your lower back as hard as you can to the floor, your spine goes through a bit of flexion and you might find holding the pelvic floor and pressing the lower back into the ground you go through a bit of spinal flexion and you feel the abs light up. And that's just a really simple way to start the movement. And then of course you can progress, like you said, Nick, maybe like that dead bug position to hold that shape. Um, and then you can progress into other ways to train your core. But if you start there, you get the feeling back and you go, oh, yeah, I feel my abs again. They're there, they're doing their thing. Then that transfers really nicely over to other abdominal training exercises like crunches and such. And then other training, training exercises like your, deadlifts and your lunges like this individual is having some challenges with. Mm, mm. And I think that would translate nicely to the deadlift movement as well, like everything that you've just described. Mm -hmm. um, so it brings it back to what she was actually wanting to do. Yep. So yeah, that that's a good, good way to transition into that. Yeah. And I think it's very you, normal it to is. feel weird after giving birth, just saying. Oh, with my experience, <laughs> absolutely, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> You're still getting back to normal and you didn't no, even do no, it. No, I, was, I wasn't even pregnant. I wasn't even, yeah. yeah. Um, I think going back to what you said about the cat and cow position, um, mm -hmm. a really great one is to actually film yourself doing the cat and cow position. And you may find like the cow position where you're, you know, arching your 
uh, back down, your belly button to the floor. And then when you move into the cat position where you round your back, when you round your back, you might find that your lower back is it's straight. You know, your upper back mm. curves nicely, but your lower back is straight. And you haven't actually moved into like lumbar flexion, your lower back flexing, meaning your abs haven't really gone through a proper abdominal contraction. Um, mm. And you might find just watching back, watching your video back and reflecting on it going, geez, I'm not even flexing my spine. I'm not even taking my abs through a full range of motion. And if you modify how you do that cat and cow, you might find a position where you get the abs, uh, the, the spine to curve, your abs to contract and the light bulb goes off. And you're like, holy abs, my, I can feel them now. <laughs> so give that a try. Film yourself doing the cat and cow and try to look for that lumbar spine to curve or a neutral curve in the spine. And I guarantee you'll have an absolutely great time. <laughs> I wish I had a dad joke for it, but um, yeah, I, I'm I'm at the end. You're at of the my end. Break, you you yeah. might be able to think about another ab joke, Nick. Yeah, I I will. Absolutely. <laughs> you you've dazzled oh. me. You're your brilliant. Now, Nick, I just want to wrap up today by um, highlighting our all stars for last week. Um, so we have. Tina Schumacher or Tina Oaks online. And Tina's been really kicking goals. She's been doing lots of our weekly check-ins. So if you haven't already, go complete some of our weekly check-ins and then really active on our Facebook group, posting lots of training videos. And overall, just kicking goals. Congratulations, Tina. You are our all-star for the week. Well done, Tina. Next, Good we have job. Angela Adams, who's been really active in our community on our social hub, being really supportive uh, to each other and posting lots of motivational quotes. So Angela, kicking goals as well. Um, congratulations to her, another one of our all-stars for the week. Next, we have Lee Atkinson. Lee's been really active on our social hub in the members area and also completing lots of our weekly check-ins. So Lee, we've been reading lots of your weekly check-ins and uh, big congratulations to you. So you are one of our all-stars for the week. Next, we have Karen Duncan. Karen's been kicking lots of goals on our Facebook social hub, also on Instagram. So she's telling her story across a few different platforms. So congratulations to Karen. And finally, we have Susan Elamor. Uh, hopefully I pronounced that right. Um, I believe she listens to the podcast. So hello, Susan. Um, and she's been more active after listening to some advice that I believe I might have said about how we get some really great results when we're active in our community. So she's being really active in that community and posting lots of training videos of herself, um, really trying to feel her quads again. So congratulations to Susan, another one of our all-stars for the week. So you too can be an all-star for the week. Just tell us what you're up to. You know, you should post about it on social media, Facebook, Instagram, tell us about it on um, the social hub in the members area. Or if you're not a fan of posting online, you can complete the um, weekly check-in. We just answer a few questions about what you're up to. Um, I get to read them. You might get an email from me and you might be an all-star of the week and take home a $200 booster pack, which is really awesome. That's so cool. I want an email from Coach Steve. <laughs> uh, so Nick, we have uh, a bunch of goodies on us on their way um, and you might get one of the one of the goodies. So just keep your eyes peeled. You might, might, might get a, a delivery soon. Excellent. Excellent. Nick, let's wrap it up there for episode number eight of the Rise Method podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, let us know and we'll catch you next week for episode number nine. Thank you very much.